So glad you're here this morning. Good to see you. If you'll take a copy of God's Word, turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 5. Romans chapter 12, verse 5. We're going to be all over God's Word this morning, looking at multiple verses today. Going to begin a brand new series. It's kind of hard to believe to plan for a brand new series when we're in one that was for an entire year that was one book of the Bible all the way through. But I've I've prepared and been praying through our series, a different series for uh, the rest of This year kind of looked out to where we're headed. We've got multiple different kinds of series we're going to do together. Uh, But last week, if you were not here, how many of you, just by chance, just to curious, how many of you were were not here last Sunday? Would you just raise your hand? I want to to mention some things to you. Yeah, enough of you. All right. So last Sunday was our our Vision Sunday, our our, uh, State of the Church message. I hope you'll take time to go back and listen to that. Uh, during the week uh, on podcast or uh, the video on YouTube. All those things are there. We'd love for you to go listen to that. But we ended our service in a way that you couldn't have seen it. Um, and, and two interesting or important parts of 2019 are this series I'm about to kick off that talks about our, our one-year challenge and goal and where we're going to really put a focus on is our life groups this year. We've, we always talk about them, but our really a strong emphasis on that, starting new groups. You're going to hear more about that today. In the next six weeks, we're going to be in a series together called Better Together. Why have life groups? Why be a part of community? Why be connected? Why is that important? Not only biblically speaking, because we already know it's there, the theology is there, the doctrine's there, but from a a local perspective, for our church, why is that vitally important? And the second thing we're going to talk about this year, or what we're going to really work together to do, is our Outlive Your Life Phase 2. And we're going to begin to complete some space, some upstairs space for our students. We ended our worship time last Sunday morning upstairs. If you didn't get to see that last Sunday, uh, we want to pr- provide somebody. We'll have to figure out how to make this work. One of our staff, maybe Joshua, Chris can, can maybe help Chris. will do that. We'll let you go upstairs and see the space, come our youth space. If you weren't able to stay last week or you weren't here last Sunday, we want you to see upstairs. Some of you don't even know we have an upstairs. We do have an upstairs. It's been unfinished since they completed the building and occupied it in 2007. We're hoping in the 20-year mark since they voted to move to this particular location in 1999, on that 20th anniversary, we want to see some major uh, inroads for some completing a lot of the space here, but also some other projects we listed out last week that will be a part of that. March the 5th is a commitment Sunday towards that effort. We've already had some lead gifts already, and I announced that last week of over $150,000 have already been given towards what we are projecting to be somewhere around $450,000, maybe as much as a half a million, to see some major projects completed that will help propel us into the next decade. Uh, and also to help us even do this ministry and this emphasis of life groups. We need more life group space. Um, we're out of space. And so creating this student space will free up some other classrooms that we'll use for additional life groups. We've got one meeting in the sanctuary. Probably have one meeting in the next six, eight weeks, an additional one in here. Um, because we want to see that become a reality. Our goal is 250. We're going to average. Now, our ultimate challenge goal is 300, which we said about two years ago. But our numbers are not where we need to be to jump that 300 mark. But we're well on our way today. We had a good attendance today. We've got some more groups to, to work at and, and be a part of that. So here's the kicker for this series and the, the biblical basis behind it. But we're going to put the practical side to it as our group leaders and those that are part of life groups are going to be reaching out to you, contacting you. You might get multiple calls from multiple people. You choose where you go. We don't require anybody to go anywhere. We open the door, say we've got these groups. You can choose a men's group, a women's group, couples groups, uh, groups that are are couples that have folks that are not couples that come to a group, all kinds of groups you can be part of. Of course, your students and your children will be a part of that. It's every hour, uh, every nine o'clock hour, rather, every Sunday morning uh, right here, and we'll get you the right spot if you don't know where those spots are. We'll put a card in the worship guide next week to remind me of this, of, of, of our updated list, and we'll put that in the worship guide. It'll be on our, our website as well so you can know where to go. But we're going to talk about uh, this series, and it's a, it's a wonderful series. In some ways, it's kind of countercultural and counterintuitive, at least to our culture sometimes, and maybe even as an American of our independence, right? We love our independence. We have the Declaration of Independence, and so you hear people say things like, you know, I got to be me. I did it my way. I don't need anybody to tell me what I need to do or what it's all about. Take care of yourself. And we've been taught and what, some of this is not bad in of itself, but if it goes too far, it's not biblical. The idea of, of independence. I'm financially independent. I'm relationally independent. I'm independent in every way. And if I'll do that, I will be the happiest that I could possibly be. But yet in our culture, we find more unhappy people than we've ever had before. And I'm going to do a summer series that's going to address this one particular issue, the issue of suicide. In our last year, in 2018, the two top leading causes of death in the United States were drug overdose, mostly opiate addictions, meth and those kinds of 
of drugs. And second, right behind it was suicide. And yet we live in the most prosperous nation. We live in the most happy nation where everybody in the world, it seems, wants to come. But yet why? Well, I think one of the reasons why is because the answer is not independence. The truth is, the scripture teaches us without any shadow of a doubt that happiness does not come from being independent, does not come from being isolated, living your life with all the barriers up and masks and keeping people at an arm's distance. True contentment, true joy, true happiness comes from interdependence. Folks, God wired us to need one another. Now, I know there's different personality types, and some of us are going like that you're like kind of a, you like a lot of alone time, those kinds of things. But here's the deal. Even those kind of personalities, God still wired you to need the body of Christ. Romans 12, verse 5, look at it. This is from the New Living Translation, so it might be a little different from what you read in yours. Here's what it says. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. Now, I want you to do me a favor just to kind of make sure you're awake this morning. It's January. It's a little cooler this morning. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to say this to your neighbor, all right? If you do this, I want you to say, you need me, all right? Would you turn to your neighbor? Tell him right now. Tell him, you need me, right? Now, <clears throat> turn to the other neighbor. Turn the other way. Tell him that way, too, all right? All right, some of you are not participating. This is participation class. All right, very good. Now, I want you to turn to that neighbor again and say, what? I need you, okay? Turn and tell him that, too. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. Right? You got it? All right. Very good. Now, we think about it for a moment. We say that, but I want you to think for a moment. Do you know the person to your right or to your left? You probably do. Maybe the person in front of you or behind you. But if you needed somebody right now, would you have somebody to be there for you? If somebody needed you, could they call you? Could they approach you? And would they know you well enough to say, hey, I need you? Yet our culture teaches us we don't need anybody. We'll take care of ourselves. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Suck it up, buttercup. Get on with it. Take care of yourself. And don't worry about anybody else. Yet the reality is that what this Bible teaches us, and you read it all throughout the book of Acts, is that this group of believers needed each other. And they needed each other in such a sense that they realized, I need you and you need me. You think to yourself, I don't really need anybody else. Well, guess what? There are people who need you. And the reality is, the truth is, if you're really honest, you really do need someone. The challenge is, is letting people in. Because we're afraid sometimes if we let somebody in, they might know us. And what if they might really know us? Are they really going to like us? And if, if they don't like us, what are they going to do? Or if they really knew me, what would they do? So I want us to talk about over the next six weeks together, what it means to be better together, not separate. And the challenge of this whole series, I want to be honest with you, and we'll know if it's a success or not, all right? We're going to have a good measuring stick. Not always in a sermon series do you know with the measuring stick of when you're successful. We'll know because here's what I'm praying and believing and asking you to do. For those of you who are already in life groups, those of you who are not, that our attendance picks up significantly in life groups because we're going to apply, listen to me carefully, we're going to apply what we're hearing. Not just words in, and words out, but words in that impact us in such a way, and I, I pray every message is this way by all means, but this one's just really easily measurable. If our life groups don't grow from this point, then, then it makes me wonder, do we really listening? Are we really understanding the word of God is not just to be heard, but to be done? There is action to be taken when we hear the word of God proclaimed. So if you're a life group leader, I'm going to encourage you to invite. Here's our call. Here's our challenge. We want 100% of people in this body in a life group. I see you're going, I've never been in a life group. I am not going to be in a life group. I don't want to be in a life group. That sounds boring. That sounds scary. That sounds whatever you want to put out there. But I want to encourage you and challenge you. That before this series is out, at least once you try a life group. It may be twice because you might not connect with the first one that you attend. But get in a life group. And why is that? There's six reasons I believe that God has created us to have this soul-to-soul fellowship. First of all is this. I need others to walk with me. I need others on your outline. You're you're following along there. I need others to walk with me. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, just as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Now, what is he talking about here? We're talking about 
growing in Christ. We're talking about your spiritual walk. Uh, growth in Christ is a journey. The Christian life is a journey. We're moving. We're going somewhere. You're, you're either moving forwards or backwards. There is a destination to us to get to. God never intended, though, for this journey for us to do it alone. That's why he gave us the church, the bride of Christ, and we break that down even further into a small group. Now, let's make it very clear about being, uh, not being alone. We're not talking about being single or married. We have single adults in our, in our church that are actively involved in our church. So the, the, the solution is not, oh, well, I don't want to be lonely. I've got to get married, right? That's not what we're talking about. I've met people that are married that are desperately lonely even though they're married. So marriage is not the antidote or, or the answer, right? And some would say, well, now, let me ask you a question. What's wrong with walking alone? And again, I refer back to some of your personalities. You need some alone time. That's part of how you're wired. That's good. But not alone time all the time because that's not how God wired you to be. Some would say, well, I like to walk alone. I get my own way when I walk alone, right? Think back when you were single, right? You remember those single days, men and women? You didn't answer to anybody. You did your own thing. Nobody was worried about what time you came in or what time you left. Nobody cared about what you ate. You didn't have to ask anybody where they wanted to go, right? Man, you never faced the dreaded conversation, right, after church. The worst question almost of all outside of do I look good in this outfit, that's the worst question. The second worst one is where do you want to go to eat? And ladies, you're going to typically answer what? Be honest. Oh, listen, they're listening to all that. And I see everybody knows, right? You got to make that decision, right? When you're, married, when, you're not, when you're single, you have to worry about that. You go where you want to go. I mean, every Saturday night, it was like clockwork. I mean, I'm kind of a loser a little bit. But that's fine. I was single Saturday nights. I, I went and got a Mr. Gaddy's Pizza. I lived in Denham Springs, Louisiana. I chose my home closest location to Mr. Gaddy's Pizza. And so I, I went there every Saturday night. This is a sad life until... I met Rebecca in my life forever changed. But, but before that, every Sunday at 7 o'clock, I got a Mr. Gaddy's Pizza at 6.45. And at 7 o'clock, I was tuned in. Matt, you ready for this? 7 o'clock, the new episode of what came on? Cops. Every Saturday night. Man, that's where I was. I didn't have to ask anybody's permission. I had to ask for the remote television. I had to fight the Hallmark Channel. Man, I just got to watch Cops, Right? When we're alone, we don't have to answer to anyone or anybody. And we kind of like that sometimes. But the reality is, in that moment, you're not learning to love. You're not learning about relationships. You're not learning about cooperating. You're not learning about not always having to get your own way. And God says, I want you to walk through life together with people. Three just thoughts about in this first point of walking together. Number one, it's safer when you walk together, right? It's safer when you walk together. Just think about it just physically when you're walking somewhere. And if there's multitudes of you and you're walking through a dark alleyway, you're walking through a place you don't know, when there's, there's usually safety in numbers. The same is true spiritually speaking when we grow together. Secondly, it's supportive. It keeps you from giving up. Sometimes we want to give up. When people are walking with you and alongside you, then you're more likely to go further down the road. Running by yourself, you want to quit. There's an old... Uh, Zambian proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. Think about that. What a great word. That's so scriptural. Life is not a 50-yard dash. It's not a series of 50-yard dashes. Life is a marathon. And God's call for most of us will be to live a long life. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a journey. And we need each other. You know the story of the geese, how they fly together. You see them here in Mississippi about this time of year, a month or so ago. You see them flying in that V formation. You know why they fly that way? Because they can fly further together. So the problem, the challenge is when we don't fly together, we don't run together, we have a tendency to quit. Thirdly, it's smarter. You learn a whole lot more when you go through life with other people that are close to you. Not just casual friends, I'm talking about people that know you, right? And in 1 Corinthians 14, this last part of this verse, it tells us here, when you do all these things together in a group, you teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, right? 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's there. Well, maybe Michael, I'm not sure if it's there or not. Um, but it says at the end there, that way you all learn from each other. In a small group setting, we, we design our small groups hopefully for there to be, be discussion, we don't do a lecture format typically. On occasions, there might be that kind of a lesson. But by and large, we want it to be discussion-oriented, right? We want to keep our groups as small as we can. So that's why we created new groups this year. We're going to continue to do that. Once a group gets to about 20, it's about as big as it needs to get. Because after that point, people become intimidated. They won't talk as much. We want folks to talk. Now, we're not going to require you to talk. We're not going to look at you and call you out and say, you better talk because that's a fear factor, people say. I don't hear all the time, oh my gosh, if somebody called on me, I would melt into a puddle into the floor, right? Hey, we're not going to do like the, the DW I went to last night and 
uh, some of our girls did a great job, and they, get, and they ask these questions on the spot, right? Wouldn't you love to answer that question in front of 300 people? Well, what do you think about the border wall? Or what do you think about insurance? I'm thinking, oh, good, uh, great, ask these girls. We got 400, 900 people in Washington, D.C. They can't figure it out, but God bless these poor little girls. They're going to give us an answer in 30 seconds to figure it all out. It's brilliant. That's not easy to do, is that a lot? That's hard to do. The rest of us were all going, oh my gosh, I'm glad I don't have to answer that question, right? It's terrible, right? But what are we talking about? The idea that we, we do things together, we work together, right? We learn from each other. So we're not going to call on you like that in that setting. And if you don't like to read, some of don't feel comfortable reading. We're not going to call you and say, hey, would you read this list of names, this, this like um, um, genealogy, it's got all these crazy names that nobody can pronounce, including the preacher, right? We're not going to ask you to do that. But it makes you smarter because you hear other people's thoughts, other people's where they are in life. And you go, oh, man, they're not, I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one who's wanted to kill my kids. That's awesome. I thought I was this horrible parent. But there's like 10 other people who wanted to kill their children last week. This is awesome, right? I mean, not really. Not really. <laughs> Maybe, you know. Right? I, I, I'm not the only one who's had marital problems. I'm not the only one who's having financial problems. I'm not the only one who's got a, a parent that is sick. I'm not the only one who's got a child that is sick. I'm not the only one who's got a, a challenge in my job. Right? It's, we get smarter. We hear things. We go, I, I need that in my life. Think about these other two verses from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter uh, 11, verse 14. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Only fools trust what they think alone is right. You see, God's number one goal is for you to love him. And the second one is to love others. And one of the best ways to learn to love God is by learning to love others one another's. Now, we all walk in different paces, right? Different steps. I never realized how fast I walked till I got married. And really, walking in the hallway, and Rebecca would say, Brad, you walk so fast. I'm like, I don't walk that fast. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just walking. I'm just getting to where I'm going to. She's like, you walk fast, right? And so, one day, we're walking down the church hallway in Baton Rouge, and it had a tile floor, and all of a sudden, I heard my shoe steps. I just actually listened for the first time, and, and my poor wife was, I was dragging her halfway behind because I, when I go somewhere, I'm, I'm on a mission, right? It's like going to the mall. It's conquer and destroy, right? It's not peruse or walk around. It is go and leave, right? That's how I, that's just how I function, right? I should be more sensitive. My grandfather, when we were little, he had a heart attack in his, when he was younger and had to walk every day for two miles. My grandfather was six foot four, okay? He walked around this track and he would take us to walk with him. Well, the problem was when I was about eight years old, I was like three foot five. I was like little Emma, you know, and trying to keep up with my grandfather. It was like nine steps to keep up with his one, right? God made us different. We walk at different paces, right? No question about that, but it's smarter, it's safer. And what's that other one we just said? It is uh, more, more supported. Now there's two different kinds of families God gives us, by the way. There's a physical family, right? And there's a spiritual family. Our physical family, right? Those that we are blood kin to. Guess what's going to happen to all those folks, including yourself at some point? They're all going to die. But a spiritual family will never die. This church, as long as there are people in this part of this body, will always be. And the church at large will always be. And so though you have a physical family and you thank God for that, you are just as called to be connected to a spiritual family. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, a verse that preachers love to quote, let us not, what does it say? Give up the habit, the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. Now, I think that's talking about twofold things. Number one, maybe it's about worship, but I think it goes far deeper than that. And that is getting connected in a life group. Because here's why. In this group right here, this is not community. Now, I can try and I'll sit in my office and think, all right, I'm going to talk to as many people from 1010 until 1030 that I possibly can. And I set a goal that I'm going to talk to like 40 people today. You know how many I usually get to? About seven, maybe nine. I'm going to work this side of the room this time. and I'm going to work. I mean, I'm strategic. This is strategic here, okay? I'm working this out. It never works out. You don't know why? And, and usually it's very, very short conversations, right? I don't, I don't get to have a life. If I get into a deep conversation, that's going to be one conversation. This right here is not community. This is worship. This is corporate worship where we are focused on the Lord, which we do in life group, but we do so from a different direction. And so this is, you're not going to be known here. And I know some of us in this culture we live in is, I want to be anonymous. And on the front side, that's fine. But you can't stay there. God never intended you to stay there. Because then all you become, watch this, is a spectator. You might as well be going to a Saints football game today at 3 o'clock as you come here 
you sing, you listen, you come at 1030, you sit, you talk to no one, and you leave as soon as it's over, and you engage other than, hi, how are you, good to see you, fist bump, elbow bump, don't hug me, I'm a germaphobe, right? And out the door you go. Is that really community? Is that what God intended the body of Christ to be like? And let me ask you a question. Is that really attractive to a lost and dying world? Hey, come. Nobody knows you. Nobody will talk to you. Nobody will care about you. Come and join our church. We'll let you be anonymous. We'll never ask you anything. We'll let you just sit out there in the chairs and nobody will ever talk to you. Come on, be a part. Wow, what an encouraging engagement that would be, right? Listen, the idea is we can be, we can be in a crowd of 10,000 or 100,000 and still feel alone. It's not about the size of the crowd. It's about where you are connected. So what is the idea here? Ephesians 4.16, what does it say here? As each part does its work, it helps the other parts grow. So Christ's whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's what God wants. God wants us to grow. And he wants us to be full, all of us to be full of love. And that happens in a life group. Now, sometimes like you, like me, perhaps maybe you've invited somebody to come to church. How many of you have ever invited somebody to come to church and you invited them and they said something like this? I was talking to several folks last night. And um, some of our members of our church and others don't attend. I was like, man, I'd love to see you tomorrow. Here's, here's what I heard. You ever heard this one before? Man, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Like, I mean, they give, almost give that little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. Which means, no, you're not. <laughs> Thanks for trying. But trying means, man, I might set an alarm. And I might press snooze 422 times. And I, and I might get there. And I really want to get there. But the reality is I'm probably not. Right? That's deflating. You ask somebody, you've asked somebody, and if you ever asked anybody and they didn't come, anybody ever asked somebody to come to church and they didn't come? Raise your hand. Just let me see. Ever had that experience before? That's no fun, is it? You know, you, and some of us, listen, we've worked up a sweat to ask somebody to come to church, right? We are freaked out. We're wondering what they're going to say. Would you come to, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you come to church with me? I'll never forget. I had this guy I was going to ask the church. We had this friend Sunday. And of course, I'm the pastor, so I have to have a friend, right, to invite us. So sometimes preachers struggle to know lost people because I'm around all of you. Mostly saved people, right? And so it's hard. I have to work at that. So I had a guy that I've been ministering to that worked at the local pizza hut. Now my friend was a Muslim, okay? And so I never asked him to come to church because I was convinced the answer would be no way, not a snowball's chance that my friend Akram was going to come to church. And reckon we talked about it. We were praying. I'm like, all right, babe, today's the day. Today's the day. Oh, so nervous. The preacher was nervous to ask somebody to come to church. Are you kidding me? Hey, I'm human just like you. I get nervous sometimes because I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be mad at me. I don't want to start screaming at me and say, why are you asking me? The Quran says this. I'm like, I don't know what the Quran says. I just know I love Jesus and I want you to know Jesus and you need Jesus and you're a great God. And I just, I mean, I've worked this whole thing up. So, I mean, I had this long spiel. I mean, I had worked it out. I mean, I had like, I had like, I don't know if it had alliterated or not, like points, but I was thinking like how I was going to work him to get there. And so I take him to lunch at this place we go to eat and I'm, and I've got my little invitation in my pocket, and I kind of slide it out, kind of being like, you know, really like low-key, you know? And I'm like, will you come to church with me on Friend Sunday? I worked this thing up, and I, and I was ready to him to say no, and I was ready. I was like that telemarketer, you know, that's got like, you go after step one, they're ready for step three. Uh, Sir, I know you don't need that, but, right, I was ready. And he said, sure, I'd be glad to. I was like, and I already, before I even heard it, I already started my argument. No, I mean, you got to come and, and you need to come. And I want you to, and I, really, I love your family. And I'm like, what did you just say? You just said yes. He's like, of course I would. You're my friend. I care about you. And for the first time in his life, he came to church. Now, I wish I could say that it all worked out great. The next Sunday, he understood who Esau Masi was and he found Jesus and it was great. No, we had discussions and and lots of discussion about the Bible and the Quran. We talk about those kinds of things. And, and, uh, but here's what I do know. One day his oldest son had caught. It was a sad day. He was in a car. There were kids in it. They gave him the, the drugs to hold. And they were scared they were going to get caught. So he swallowed them. And he died. And you know who he called? He called his friend. So I was able to tell him the truth of the gospel and share the gospel with his wife. Now, to this day, I still don't know exactly. I've shared the gospel with him multiple times. Not talked in the last couple of years, lost contact with him a little bit, and his wife passed away a few years ago. But I shared the gospel with her. Here's what I want you to know. 
Sometimes that invitation, you got to ask two and three and five and ten times. Now, you can't hound people, right? We know what that's like, right? Right, you see them in Walmart and when they do this to you, okay? Can I just give you some nonverbal hints? When they see you and they do this. <laughs> oh my gosh, they're going to ask me to church. That's a key to know. You might need to back off just a tad, okay? When you see that, just pray for them. Or when you talk to them, don't talk about church. Talk about life. Talk about what's going on in their life. How can I pray for you? And our intention, by the way, if you've ever been, somebody's done that to you and tried to encourage you to come, their intention is not bad, by the way. They're not trying to be ugly or cruel or or trying to get in your business or trying to hound you to death. They just really genuinely care and want you to be connected to a church and to a life group. But don't let the no deter you from asking this. Here's what I know to be true about people. Most people, I won't say 100% because I've met a few that they would say no way. Most people want to belong. They really do. But there are things that come with belonging that are scary, that are difficult. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want somebody to not like me. In a church this size, we're not all going to know each other. We're not all going to be best friends. We're not all going to hang out with each other regularly. We're going to have different groups of people that hang, and there'll be different groups that connect. That's fine. We don't want to create cliques. That's not the idea of a life group, by the way, either. But we want to connect on a deep level. That's what God called us to do. So what is this community? Is God's answer to loneliness. Community is God's answer answer to loneliness. So I'm praying over these next five Sundays, if you're not connected to a life group, that you'll get connected to one. You don't know how to do that, you'll see a staff person will help you find one that works for you. Visit a couple, find one that works for you. If you can't find one that works for you, then guess what we'll try to do? We'll try to start another one. We want to start as many as we can because we know the more we have, the more people we can reach and connect with the gospel. Some of you have been here three years, a year. Some of you have been here 10 years and you've never gotten connected I want to plead with you. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to get connected to a life group. All right? Secondly, and some of you are looking at the clock already going, 1115, that's point number one. This just became a seven-part series. We're not going to get through today. What a surprise. I have such great intentions. All right, number two. I need people, I need others to work with me. I need people, I need other people to work with me. God put you and I, all of us, on earth to do a certain kind of thing. God's gifted you. God's equipped you. God's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you a heart of things you're passionate about. He's given you certain abilities. He's given you certain a personality. And then your life experiences all shape who you are. But you can't do that shape. You can't do those things without being in a community. Of believers. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. Before you were ever born, right? Before you were ever born, let me explain this to you. How do do you explain before you were born to a five-year-old, right? That's a good word. Emma, we'll show her pictures because we have lots of pictures before she came. Because we were a family a long time before she came. And so we have pictures. And she say, where was I? Why was I not in that picture? Well, because we hadn't thought about you. Didn't know we were going to think about you. Right? Our boys just now figured out that that wasn't exactly our plan. How that all worked out. That was God's plan. They kind of figured that all out. So we're left, we're talking like, how do we explain to her? So a couple of pictures say, well, you were mama's tummy. She said, yeah, but where was I before that in that picture? Here's what we told her. God was still working on you. He wasn't quite ready for you to come. Maybe more like he was working on us. Maybe it was probably the better way because we sure weren't ready. (laughs) God, before you were ever born, think about this, Rowan. Before you were ever born, God created you to do something significant, something impactful, something purposeful with your life. And he gave you the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the passion, the life experience, and the personality to do that thing. Not after you were born, God didn't go, oh, well, they were born to this family. I guess I'm going to shape them this way. No, God already planned it all out. The question is, will we connect to that plan? Will we do those things that God has called us to do? 
Anytime you use your talents, God has given you to help other people. We call that ministry or service. Now, here's the challenge about working in ministry. Some, some of you came in the building this morning. You know what? You're tired. You're worn out and you're tired. We can describe that. And some of us are tired because you try to do it all by yourself or you try to do it all or both, right? God never intended us to do it that way. God meant for us to have people in our lives so you're not trying to do it all alone. Ecclesiastes chapter four says this. Two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. Now think about this. This is not rocket science here. You'll be really impressed with this illustration. A snowflake. How big is a snowflake typically? Not very big, right? One snowflake. I think we've moved here the first year and there were some snowflakes in the air. It lasted about, I don't know, four or five minutes and it was gone. It obviously didn't stick. It didn't snow long enough. It had no impact. One snowflake, a hundred snowflakes. But when you put thousands and thousands of snowflakes... Like you saw in St. Louis, Missouri Friday, it brought I-44 to a screeching halt. 18-wheeler drivers just went ahead and went to sleep in their calves because they weren't moving. They were going to knock on their windows with tow trucks to try to wake them up to get them to, to tow their trucks to move them. What am I saying? You as an individual can have a minimal impact. And you can have sometimes a very significant impact but you can only do so in a few people. Let me just make this, this correlation for us. We, when we first started thinking about how can we impact our community, we're like, what, how can we touch our, our community? So otherwise, we've we got to kind of pinpoint some people that maybe we wouldn't normally touch. And so that's how we narrowed down to the primary school. We made a relationship and made a connection. Mark Ferris at Pastor Summit said, you know, you ought to adopt Pedal Primary School. Now, if he'd have told me, if I'd have known then what we know now, I'm not sure. We exactly we didn't know what was gonna we didn't know what that meant. We're like, sure, absolutely. Who knew what it would morph into, right? But one person can't do all that. There's a multitude of people who make that ministry happen every single week and every single year. But I want you to watch the impact that's now happened. Now, and not just because of us, other people were already in this, we're in this. Uh, thought process already. It wasn't just, we weren't the groundbreaking people. We adopted, we started doing some things. And now, every school in our district has a church or churches that have adopted that school. Now, our church can have an impact, but what is the impact when we work together to have an impact on our community? It's far greater, isn't it? Now, think about this. Let me just narrow this down a little bit. Use an individual what if in your small group, in your life group, you, and this is one of our visions, our prayers have been all along, is that when we begin to do missions, and so fire up Melanie Blanton, we do missions that we don't just think about, oh, well, let's plan some big mission project. What if in your small group, y'all looked around in your, in your talent pool of the abilities that God has given you and said, what could we do together to serve our community? How can we make an impact? What could we do? And not just always wait, and though that's going to happen, we're going to have projects come up. We're going to build a house in 42 after 28. We're going to do some things. We're going to do a backyard kids club. But, but what if you and your group begin to think and pray, God, how can we collectively as a group use our talents to impact our community? You see, you can do far more together than you can ever do alone. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is the pot calling the kettle black. And I think I've mentioned this before. But one time I moved, when I was moving from one house to the other, right before Rebecca and I got married, maybe six, eight months a year before we got married, I moved from one house to the other. I moved in a really small house when I first moved there. I was getting married, trying to get a little bit bigger house. So we, I was going to move. And so um, I'll never forget, and I see Gwen Ann over here, it reminds me, uh, Barney Foreman and uh, Mr. Humphreys, Pat Humphreys, husband, they called me because I was going to move myself. Now think about that for a minute. How stupid is that? Me going to move, now I didn't have a lot of stuff, but I had a washer and a dryer and a refrigerator. Hey, back then I was skinny. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I could, I, now I got a little more girth so I can move things, I guess. But I, I was going to move all that stuff all by myself. I got a dolly and I got a truck. You know how far I got on that first day? Not very far. And that friend of mine called me and he said, and he did. Man, he wore me out. He said, what in the world are you doing? Are you stupid? You think you're going to move yourself 
And he really chastised me in a way I really needed it. He said, but I said, I didn't want to inconvenience anybody. I didn't want to put anybody out. I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to have to make somebody like take off of work or stop doing what they were doing. I, have to, I was just going to move myself. And here's what he told me. You robbed me of an opportunity to bless you and help you and serve you. And my pride was like, but I don't want anybody to have to do that. You know what that was? That's pride. He said, whether you ask or not, we're in the car. We're on our way over there right now to help you move. Can I tell you, I was so grateful that they came and helped me move. I was so grateful. I've never done that again. Now, does it bother me when I have to call and ask people for help? Can I just be honest? It kills me. I know everybody's busy. I've, I've moved since I've been here. I hated to call those guys. But I can't move by myself. Right? And there are all kinds of other examples we're going to get to in part two <laughs> of this message. Right? That we need each other. Community is God's answer to fatigue. Community is God's answer to fatigue. Now, let me be clear, too, about these answers, God's answers. What, what do you mean by that? And the ultimate answer we know is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ, right? But the reality is God's given us this body of believers, right? This community of faith to flesh out God's work in our lives. So ultimately, where do I find my relationship? I find it with the Lord. That's where it's first and foremost. But then it begins to flesh out and it prevents fatigue. I've met people throughout the years of 28 years and 29 almost of doing ministry. And I've met some church folks that I love a lot, deeply committed believers. And they've served for decades. And sometimes they get really tired. They get really tired. Because there'll be people repetitively over and over and over again, they're commit, they're going to come, and I'm going to serve, and I'm going to do this, and they just don't show up or don't commit or don't come or whatever the case may be. And they think to themselves, well, it won't matter if I don't show up. It doesn't matter if I miss. And what they don't realize is that they put a whole lot of pressure on people that are really working hard, and those people get really fatigued. It's what we call burnout. And they just want to quit because it seems nobody else wants to help. And by the way, this is a challenge in every church of every size, small, medium, and large. It's one of Satan's greatest tools to keep the body of Christ to be ineffective. Would you just think with me for just a moment? Is Carrie Fordham in here? Where are you, Carrie? Are you in here still? She's in the back. Denise, where are you, Denise? Denise Inman, there you are. Wave your hand. Chris Robbins, wave your hand. Okay. Melanie Blanton, wave your hand. Okay, that is not waving your hand. Okay, this is waving your hand. Okay. Josh Smith, wave, wave your hand over here. Okay. If I told you today, Lauren Mizell, raise your hand over there. I forgot you. All right. If I went and told you, I said, listen, I've got 25 people that are about to drive me nuts to serve in your area. What would you say to me, staff? Hallelujah. Sign them up today, right? We often love to call it when new folks join, we call it in the church world, in the underworld, we call it fresh blood, Right? I've already asked this other person 25 times. This new person, we've never asked them yet, right? Could you think about that for a moment? What if everybody decided, I'm going to get connected to a life group? We wouldn't have enough room. We have enough leaders. We could start multiple new groups. We could start multiple new kids groups, right? We need each other. God's answer is community for fatigue, right? Galatians 6.10, I'm going to close with this. Galatians 6.10 says this, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. That means right here, church, right here. Now, I'm going to jump some other ones next week. I fully intended to get to all six, but bad chance. I want you to really pray in just a moment when I close I don't want to ask you this question. And it's a probing one. It's a challenging one. But I want you to know as your shepherd, that's my job. That's my call. Sometimes it's to make us a little uncomfortable. But I want to ask you this question. A couple of questions. Number one, are you a member of a body of believers? Are you a member? That's significant. We'll talk about that next week. Why that's significant. But are you a member? Okay. That's biblical. It's called of God. We ought to be a part of the body of Christ. That's your first step. 
If it's not here, then somewhere else. Now, we'd love for it to be here if that's where God's called you to plant your life. But I want to encourage you, it doesn't take four, five, nine months to visit to figure out if God wants you somewhere, right? When you try food, you try something, you don't try it 27 times before you decide you like it or not or feel like, that's, I'm, I feel called to eat this restaurant. No, you go back and you try it multiple times and you go, that's one of my favorites. You pray about it and you say, God, this is where you want me to be. And so you, you join. You're a member. Folks, we want you to know membership matters. It's not just putting your name on a roll. It really, in our hearts and minds, it matters. Secondly, if you're a member, are you connected? Are you in a life group? Okay. If you're not, then here's one of the simple, easy ways to put into practice what we've talked about. Email us, text us, call us. Staff will get you connected to a life group by next Sunday. We'll help you. I promise you there's a life group leader in here that's going to say, nah, we got all we need. You need to find you somewhere else. Any life group leader going to say that? No, nope. we'll fire you if you do. So don't say that. No, I'm kidding. Right, they're not going to say that, right? So it's to get connected to a life group. Well, I don't, I've not been in five years. It's going to be awkward. People are going to say, well, why are you just not coming to life group? You're only coming because the preacher talked about it last Sunday. Can I just give you a fresh word from God? Nobody's thinking that. And if they are, just knock them upside the head in Jesus' name, okay? Right, nobody's thinking that. Just, just get over that. That's a pride thing. Don't worry about what somebody's going to say. Just go do it. Now, let me ask you the third thing. Some of you are in a life group going, <laughs> that's right. That message is, I got that covered. That's good. And I can sit back and relax. Okay. Let me ask you a question then. <laughs> You're not going to get off scot free. Are you allowing or, call, or, or relying on your life group leader to do everything in your life group? Make all the contacts, find all the fellowships, do all the stuff. Are you, an, are you ownership of your, of your group? Is it, part, is it you? you want, you're a part of it and you want to be here. See, we want life groups. We want people to want to be here. I mean, honestly, can I just be truthful? I really honestly, this is the God honest truth. I'd rather you be more excited about coming to a life group, and some of you already are, and it doesn't hurt my feelings, about coming to a life group than you are coming to hear me preach. I'm serious. You'll most of the time get more out of a life group than you will a sermon in community with other people. So if you're in a life group, would you take ownership of it? Would you invite somebody? Would you call somebody? Would you connect with somebody? Ask your life leader, who's in our group, right? If you don't know somebody, know somebody, say, ask them before you go out the door. Are you in a life group? That'll get real uncomfortable, won't it? <laughs> just ask everybody on the way out the door. Are you in a life group? Are you in a life group? I don't know you, but are you in a life group? Right? Just ask everybody, right? So everybody just feel like they didn't get left out, right? So you're going, oh my God, what am I going to say? Just say, no, I'm not, but I will be next Sunday. Thanks for asking. <laughs> right? Ownership. See, here's what we believe. Church ought to be a place you love to come. Not that you dread. Not that you, oh, Lord, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> Not good morning, Lord, but good Lord, it's morning. It's Sunday morning, right? It's my only day to sleep in. It's my only day to do it. I know, I, I hear all those things. I hear them, I get it. But I want to challenge you. As we talk about we're better together than it's biblical. The last one, and I'll pray. And I skipped this one to start with. Better together. Some of you have never gotten to be a part of a body of Christ because you're not a part of the body of Christ. You've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart and your life. Now listen, I want to close this right here. Our praise team is going to make this way. I want every person glued in right here. Every person in this room. Our praise team is going to make this their way. Come on. Okay. While they're making their way, ignore them. Look at me. And listen, this is so critical. Do you know Jesus Christ and do you have a relationship with him? Are you connected to him? I'm not asking, do you know about him? I'm not asking, have you uh, come to church before? I'm not asking you, do you know all the Bible stories? But I'm asking, do you know Christ and does he know you? I want to encourage you today, if you've never, ever asked Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, if you've never admitted to God that you're a sinner, that you've missed the mark and fallen short of God's glory, if you would ask him then to forgive you of all those sins, he will. That's the great news of the gospel. If you will believe that he is the son of God who loved you and wants to have a relationship with you and has a purpose and a plan for your life. And that he came and lived a perfect sinless life in a sin-filled world and died a sinner's death for you and for me before we were ever even thought about. He loved you that much. And you would confess him as savior. I need you to save me. I cannot save myself. 
And today, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. And you'll be the boss of my life. If you've never done that today, there's no more important decision you could possibly make. Child, teenager, adult, grandparent, wherever you are in life, those are the calls this morning. How will you respond? Would you pray with me this morning?